God gives us the power to accomplish what He has assigned us to do, not what we decided to do ourselves. Really. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hemmer. And I'm Janice. And this is the weekend edition today of the program. It is great to be with you. And Ryan is here, and Janice is here, and Corey is off. And it is interesting because we are going to discuss the past segments from the last week that yeah. you've talked about. It's going to be I'm, great. I'm looking forward to Ivan Pennant. I know he's a really fascinating individual, as you would say. <laughs> he, he, well, he, he is. Yeah, and, he and was, yeah. He wrote many articles in the New York Times, published in the New York Times and many other places. Nobody knew him until really about 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. And then people got him because he was really into, now he's dead now, mm -hmm. but he was into establishing the Bible and with a number seven. Very interesting. So stay there as we continue. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, Take nothing for the journey, neither staffs nor bag nor bread nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the old prophets had risen again. Herod said, John I have beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? So he sought to see him. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. our lives to God through His Son, Jesus Christ, we become new creation. That's a new creation with renewed purpose. When I was in high school, I remember my counselors, and they advised me to choose a career so that I could begin my training for the future. Looking back, I wasn't encouraged to pray or first consider what God was preparing for me. It was a dilemma. You see, growing up, we are encouraged to make decisions that will help us prepare for the future, and we have to decide that. And that's good, I think. Yet we should understand that it is God who ultimately calls each of us to His plan and His purpose. As we give our lives to God, following the Lord Jesus Christ, He begins our training now for our, ready for this, eternal work eternal work. This is what we read about in Luke chapter 9 as Jesus gathers his disciples together to send them out to preach and heal the sick. Jesus equips each of them with power and authority as they will need it. Now, this is absolutely stunning. So we should learn to pray. And one of the things that I believe the enemy tried to do back in the 1950s and 60s was stop the people from praying. I remember asking someone, to, there was a movie, Pearl Harbor, and I remember asking someone who was at Pearl Harbor, what'd you think of the movie? He said, well, the movie was accurate, but they didn't cover everything correctly. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, there was a lot of prayer meetings going on. Really? He said, yeah, that's why we won the war. Really? Interesting. Very interesting. Anyway, as we begin to focus on this today, we learn that our future and our eternal task that we're going to be doing, and there are probably several of them, our eternal task is exciting and it's great. So get your Bible guides and turn to today's passage. If you don't have a Bible guide, you can write for yours. Let me just say that 
We appreciate the donations that people send us. It, it is so good. Thank you so much for doing that. And I want to tell you that that's the way we're supported here. We, you know, we don't have a big gift here, a big gift. We, we just have people just give as God speaks to their hearts. And I would simply ask that you pray about it and ask the Lord what he would have you do. And, and uh, when he speaks to your heart, just make sure you do it. Because sometimes the enemy likes to trip us up and get thoughts involved through all kinds of different things. So just pray about it and ask what God would have you do and do that. And when you go to get your Bible guide, you can write to us the address on the bottom of the screen, or you can call us. That's a faster way to do it. Or if you want to get everything going now, you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. That is great because let me tell you something. Uh, that's a new website and I'm very excited about it. BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's excellent. So go there and you can make your donation accordingly. Today, the assignment. And you say, what assignment? Everybody has an assignment. When we come to Christ, we get the image of who he is. He begins to speak to us and suddenly our lives begin to change because that's what a Christian is, somebody whose life is changed. It's not a cultural thing. It's, it's somebody whose life is changed. And the assignment from Luke chapter 9 is good. Father, help us today as we focus on Luke 9 and read from it. Help us to apply it to our heart. Help us to hear the things that we need to hear. Because, Lord, there are some ways that we've kind of messed up everything. And there are other ways that we haven't really paid attention. But I pray, Lord, that we would all hear you today when you talk to us. In the name of Jesus Christ. And we said together, all of us, amen. Look at Luke chapter 9, because as we focus on this, the Lord is speaking. Then he, that is God, called his 12 disciples together, and he gave them power and authority. Two words here. One word is power, and the other is authority. He gave them power and authority, watch this now, over all demons. What? God gave power and authority over all demons. And he gave them power and authority to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey. Neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Take nothing. Now, here's what we need to hear. God gives us the power to accomplish everything that he has assigned to us. We are given the power to do that. This power is given through the Lord Jesus as we follow him. Many people are Christians and they make their own decisions, not even considering the Lord Jesus Christ. And they go here and go there and do this and do that. Wait a minute. God has given you everything amazing divine authority to do the things that he's asked you to do. Now, let me tell you what happens. What happens, you make your own decision, you go off in that direction, and you say, well, I'm doing this, God, I'm doing this, how come? Well, you never prayed about it. You never asked God, should I do that? So it's good to pray about before you make all of these decisions. We need to include God into our life and say, Lord, I need to pray about this because that's important. So God then goes further, watch this now, what, he says, whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city. Now, this is interesting because they're going in the name of Jesus Christ. Whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, the very dust from your feet, shake it off as a testimony, a testimony against them. So they depart and then they went through the towns preaching the good news and healing everywhere. The disciples of Jesus Christ. A lot of people forget this. They don't remember. God gives us authority to do what he called us to do, beloved. You are called by God to share the testimony and do things. The disciples went out preaching the gospel and healing the sick because they were called to do that. You know what? I tell people, somebody sees me at the donut shop or whatever, and they tell me, Rod, I'm just struggling, I'm having, I grab their hand and right in the middle of the donut shop, doesn't matter, we pray in the name of Jesus. 
I don't say, I'll pray for you and leave. I just pray in the name of Jesus. We're not loud, but we just pray in the name of Jesus. Because if we don't do that, if we don't act and if we don't respond, what happens is we forget and it doesn't happen. Beloved, prayer is so powerful. It, it, it's a key to understanding God and, and to living the way he's called us to live. This is very important. Now, let's go to this last part because this is good. Luke 9, 7 to 9. Now, Herod the Tetrarch heard all that was done by him, that is Jesus, and he was perplexed. He was perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead and by some that Elijah had also appeared and by others that one of the old prophets had risen again. And Herod said, John, I have beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? So he sought to see him, Herod did. Now, this is interesting. Herod was captured by the works of Christ only. There are many people who are captured by the works and the activities of Christ in the church. It is not enough to be captured by the works of Christ. We must give our lives to Christ. We must follow Jesus Christ. That's what a Christian is. And I was preaching and talking and I've seen many people really respond to the Lord. But you know what happens to them? I, a lot of people did this. They responded to the Lord and they got good and for about six months they were good and then they just wandered off on their own place, on their own line, didn't read the Bible, didn't pray, just kind of wandered off. And I wonder, did they really give their life to Jesus Christ? Did they really do that? Did they really? I mean, all of us thought they did, but did they really? And that's the key that we need to remember, that our lives must be dedicated to the Lord according to the Bible. That's why Jesus Christ said to Nicodemus, unless you're born again, born a second time, you can't really see the kingdom of God. You've got to be born again. And so, beloved, today I would ask that all of us commit our lives to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I need you now. Help me to serve you with my whole life. I'm not going to walk away anymore, but help me to serve you with all that I have. We just want to say thank you to our partners who've helped us all get this far and continue to do so. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot to us. You know, as we look at this, Ryan, uh, one of the things that we talked about earlier this week was your report on Mysteries of the Bible, the mystery mm -hmm. of the last 12 verses of Mark, yeah. chapter 16, verses 9 to 20. That's right, yeah. These are disputed. These verses are, are very much disputed. Some Bibles put it, many Bibles put it in a footnote like this Bible here uh, because they believe it was added later. So if it was added later, okay, so the question is, how much later? You know, that's the yeah, question. It's, I mean, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, you had people quoting from it 8150, though. Oh, so my goodness. it's close. That's, that's right? really close. It's close. <laughs> so, 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 I mean, that's, that's now the, the, my ESV Bible says that the earliest documents do not necessarily have the containment from chapter uh, 16, verses 9 through, through 20. Yeah. Uh, but there are some Bibles that just leave it in there because and they don't put yeah. any comments. Yeah. Now, the reason is, I mean, mainly is the stylistic differences as well. Uh, it's not just that some, some manuscripts don't have it, but there is stylistic differences. Um, but what this report showed was uh, actually writing off the work of Dr. Ivan Panin, who was a mathematician, and uh, he was a uh, Jew and a Russian, and... Um, he fi figured out all of these heptatic constraints, the, you know, the sevenfold nature of the passage. And this is what this segment explored. And um, <clears throat> he actually identified 75 of these uh, heptatic constraints in these 12 verses alone in the original Greek. 75? 75, yeah. So what does that mean, 75? Different what? instances of basically sevens. Um, okay. You know, like, like for example, I'll just re review a little bit mm -hmm. of what I talked mm -hmm. about. Um, the original Greek, uh, this passage contains 175 words 
of these words, a total vocabulary of 98 different words are used, uh, and the number of letters in this passage is 553, and all three of these numbers are exact multiples of seven. Also, both the number of vowels and oh, consonants. Hold on, hold on. Three and the number of seven. So the number three and the number seven. Yeah. That's very interesting. Father, yeah. Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Um, so both the number of vowels and consonants in the passage are also exact multiples of seven. Um, and we can keep going because as we examine the vocabulary of those 98 words, 84 are found before in Mark, 14 are found only here, 42 are found in the Lord's address, and 56 are not a part of his vocabulary here. All of these are also multiples of seven. Interesting. Yeah. Also, the total word, word forms in the passage are 133. 112 of them occur only once, leaving 21 of them occurring more than once. And these occur 63 times. Again, all multiples of seven. And I can keep going and going. Uh, well, with okay, this, I, I want you to keep going in a minute, but uh, I, I, I want people to understand because not a lot of people will understand Ivan Panin. Who was Ivan Panin? And he was somebody who was, like you said, a Jewish Russian who before 1917, before the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, where they overthrew the government and they became a communist nation, the USSR, yeah. um, Russia was established in the 800 AD uh, by a gentleman by the name of Vladimir, and he used the church to pull together cities and create Russia. And that's what they did, and they were operating all this time. But then there was a lot of things that took place. One of them was that the, uh, the, the czar in Russia was manipulated by the local priest who was in fact very corrupt and uh, he said you know in order for your son who had hemophilia in other words he had a disease where his blood would not coagulate so if he got cut or hit or something he would just bleed to death he said in order for your son to be cured and healed by God I have to sleep with your daughters and that's how he did it and that was all going on and so this spawned the Bolshevik Revolution, which was the revolution of communism. And so Ivan Panin needed, he didn't feel right about it, but he needed as a Russian to leave, so he left. And he was very much an agnostic. He, was, he wasn't an atheist, but he was an agnostic. In other words, he didn't really believe in God and all that. And he came to Canada first for a short period of time, then he went down to New York. And he went down to New York to get a job, and he got a job at a local university and he had to learn Hebrew simply because he was somebody who, who didn't know Hebrew. And so he was a brilliant, brilliant mind. And so he, within a year, he learned Hebrew. And he began to study it and study it and study it. When you learn Hebrew, ancient Hebrew, there's only one place to really learn it, and that is the Bible. Mm -hmm. So he didn't know it, but he was learning Hebrew from the Bible, studying the Bible. That's what he did. So as he studied the Bible, um, he noticed some things. One of the things he noticed was their, their patterns. And he couldn't figure it out, patterns of seven, numbers, because he was working with numbers as well. And he said, wait a minute, that's numbers. He checked Shakespeare, he checked the Homer's Iliad, he checked all of the different uh, Vedas uh, that he could find, and he checked uh, the uh, Quran and so on, and he couldn't find patterns in those. Mm -hmm. But he found number patterns in the Bible. Yep. As a result of that, he paid attention to the Bible and slowly but surely over the course of two or three years, he gives his life to Jesus Christ. Yeah. And he is fascinated by the idea of the Hebrew bringing out patterns and showing the hand of God in this. So Second Peter talks about, you know, men were possessed by the Spirit of God when they wrote the Bible. Yeah. So he proved it. And he said, this is it. Now, he also learned Greek the same way and did the same thing with Greek. This guy, Ivan Panin, he was a brilliant engineer. And people don't appreciate this. I'm just, I'm sorry, but I'm just really excited about this guy. And uh, anyway, so uh, he, he really developed and he began to write articles about this. Many of them were published in the early 1900s by the New York Times and other places. People can get a hold of his documents if they go on to Amazon. But he was an amazing man. Also, and he was buried here in Hamilton, not mm -hmm. far from here. Uh, and so it's really interesting. So it that's is. Ivan Panin. That's who he was. So this information now, now carry on reading. 
Okay. Well, it, yeah, there's a lot of examples, and you can always go back and, and check uh, this segment that I did uh, if you want to review it more. But you mentioned the original languages as well, and that's, that's where it also gets interesting because, as you know, Hebrew has mathematical um, numerical values, right? Mm -hmm. Well, so does the Greek. And when you actually add up the numerical value of the passage in the Greek, it comes out to 103,656. Again, a multiple of seven. Seven. Yeah. Uh, and here's something I wasn't able to put in the segment, a little uh, extra tidbit. The value of verses 9, 10, and 11, respectively, are also multiples of seven. The value of verses 12 through 20 is a multiple of seven. And in verse 10, the values of the first, middle, and last words are each multiples of seven. And the value of all the word forms is also a multiple of seven. Again, that's three and seven. Yeah. Three and seven. So there might be some people sitting at home saying, so what's the big deal? The big deal is it doesn't happen with Shakespeare. It doesn't happen in the Homer's Iliad. It doesn't happen, of course, yeah. in the Vedas, and it doesn't happen in the Quran. So what does that mean? Well, I don't know. What does it mean? So I think, as uh, I mentioned uh, on the earlier program, earlier in the week, uh, the way Ivan Panin reacted to this was the right way. It brought him to the realization mm. that this is the hand of God here. The author is different. Right, yes. exactly. So he went in the right direction. Some people get off on this kind of stuff into numerology and all that. That's not what I'm promoting. That's not what we're promoting. We're just simply saying, hey, look, God has his fingerprint all throughout this book. And there's, mm -hmm. so, this is just one example right, yeah. of this. So that's, that's what we need to take away from this. This is... This belongs in Scripture, I believe. This is no ordinary book. No, exactly. And, and this passage in Mark belongs in the Bible. Now, was it added uh, a bit later on? Yeah, it could have been. Could have been added a little bit later on in Mark's lifetime. It may have been Mark himself. It may have been somebody else. Like, you know, in Deuteronomy, it's Moses' obituary. Well, obviously Moses didn't write that. <laughs> it was yeah. probably Joshua. But it was still attributed to Moses. So mm -hmm. we could be dealing with a similar situation here. Um, but Timothy, Paul tells us in Timothy that all scripture is given God by God it's God breathed, right? So and, and so, the, I mean, if it is God breathed, you're looking for, uh, well, if God breathed scripture, what does that mean? Well, I mean, in the numbers, and we don't worship the numbers, we're not doing that, but in the numbers, it simply means that they're going to be unique, and they're unique. Yeah. And that's just one. Mm -hmm. I mean, he wrote articles about all the scripture. And uh, th there's tons of articles that Ivan Panin has written. Uh, what, a, what an amazing guy. Also, the, the genealogy in Matthew, I think it is, oh. is also <laughs> it's a whole other thing. Don't even start whole me other on that. Thing. Yeah, but Ivan Panin, yeah, his works, some of them you can't find. They're so rare and old. But some of them are being reprinted. So. Yeah. So that's good. I have a, a book of his articles that were written for the New York Times, and uh, it is uh, well, apparently one of the last uh, things that was ever published. And uh, he, they, they didn't publish it at that time, but they put it together in a book and published that book. So that is very interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I'm just, it's people discover this about the Bible throughout time, and they discover this and they say, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, the, the, what, what is this? And they realize that God is written, and the author of the scripture is Jesus Christ. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's important for us to remember that when Jesus Christ said things and when he did things, uh, he said them and did them for, for a reason, but he said them and did them in the theophany, which is Jesus Christ before he was incarnate, before he was born on the earth, and he existed with God at the beginning of time, Father, yeah. Son, Holy Spirit. And um, so we need to remember that, that when Jesus Christ says things, yeah. it's not that he thought of it at that moment, it's just that he said it because it's always been existing. So his yeah. words are eternal. Yeah. And he said that not one jot or tittle will disappear until all is fulfilled. And then it won't disappear then because it'll be forever. Yeah. So when you read the Bible, which is what we encourage you to do here at Quick Study Television at Bible Discovery TV, is we discover who God is. We discover the Bible. And when you discover that, you're discovering something that doesn't go away. You're discovering something that lasts for eternity, even after you're gone. Yeah. And I think that's something that we should remember because uh, people say, well, don't read the Bible. It's just an old book full of a bunch of stuff. No, it's actually... It's actually God speaking to us. 
about what to do, how to do it, and, and how to act, and all that, and what human nature does, because it tells the truth about human nature. You know, the Bible is a violent book because of that, and uh, a lot of people are, you know, they, they, well, the Bible doesn't do that, and it doesn't do that, but it says this is a terrible, well, no, it's only terrible because it reports human nature, what human nature did. From the beginning, God, God said there's one man for one woman, and they got married, and that's how and it's not a terrible book. You start at the beginning and you begin to read through it. Right to the and end. it's it's a life played out. It's finding out who Jesus Christ is. It's finding out who God the Father is and how merciful and how loving that he is towards you. Absolutely. So remember today to read your Bible.